Check, 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 test, 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 one, two, three, four. Test, test, test. Good evening. My name is Fred Behrens. I'm the President and Chief Executive Officer of AOG Wealth Management, and we are delighted to welcome you to the first of our client special events for 2023. Uh, Eric and her team have a great uh, calendar of events for this year, and we're just really excited about being you know, back in kind of normal operating procedure. Um, I'm especially uh, happy with the um, education program for tonight. We've got a fantastic speaker from a wonderful, wonderful company. But in the meantime, um, I just thought about it tonight, and I wish I had thought about it this afternoon. Uh, we have had a very productive year so far in just the last 30 days. Um, we have a, a, one of our independent trustees of our fund had a little boy. Uh, one of our administrative people uh, from Texas had a little boy. Last week, Michelle Whitlock had a little boy. Next week, Beyond Piper's wife is supposed to have a little boy. And Lydia Goslin is due with a little girl in March. So a very productive first quarter for AOG Wealth Management. <laughs> and next time I'll remember and we'll do the baby pictures so I'm not just describing things to you, but a lot of joy around the office. I've never seen so many showers since I uh, graduated high school and <laughs> quit playing football. So, All right, so um, you know we always have the lawyers have to weigh in tonight, so quickly memorize that. Good, well done. Uh, one other thing I should mention, um, we're going to try to stay on a very tight time frame. We've got this crazy light here because... We are broadcasting out, we're streaming to about 24 people uh, who are joining us from around the country. 
Um, I don't think of anybody international tonight, but um, you know, with COVID, we learned how to do this, and now everybody wants us to keep doing it. So whether you're here getting to eat a steak with us or you know, munching on a delicious steak at home, uh, either way, you're going to get some great information to go with your meal tonight. So uh, the staff has uh, grown just a little bit. Um, Susan White got kicked upstairs. Actually, she got kicked around the corner. Um, and uh, please welcome Sabrine in the back here. Um, she's only been with us about two months, but she's doing a fantastic job already. So we're up to 14 people, and uh, you guys keep on you know, sending us more money and referring more clients to us. So we have to keep growing the staff so we can take great care of you. Um, so uh, th I wanted to mention our financial planning. We introduced eMoney. Again, we actually used it about 10 years ago. We didn't like it. Uh, it was kind of clunky, and so we went to our own customized system. It was called Spreadsheets. But uh, Fidelity bought them and put tens of millions of dollars, more than that probably, over the last seven years. So we love it. We introduced it back again two years ago. And almost all of you are using it really well, so I'm proud of you. Uh, you jumped in this new technology. It's a fantastic platform. Um, and so the key thing is most uh, portfolios look like that blue with the gray. Uh, most advisors that only use stocks and bonds, they, they hope that you run out of life before you run out of money. Um, we like to see lines going up and to the right. So um, if you have friends, family, colleagues, neighbors, people you care about, we've got some tough stuff coming down the road, and we would rather see them with the blue and the green than the blue and the gray. Very technical, technical speech there. Um, so... Uh, you all know about our AOG fund. Uh, we are so proud of this. Uh, we just had our one-year birthday for this uh, back in December. And as of January 12th, um, we, for, for you all, we only needed to file under the 1940 Securities Act. But with a lot of prodding from the industry and around the country, uh, we decided we were going to open it up and let other advisors uh, utilize this. And so we're effective under the 1933 Act. Uh, the other thing is, with a lot of great engineering, hard work, and discussions with lawyers and accountants and so forth, uh, we thought we were going to have to keep it so that only accredited investors could use this fund. However, um, with this filing, as of January 12th, it is now available even to investors who have less than a million dollars. So instead of our fund reaching a maximum of, say, $3 million, $3 million households, uh, now it's available to lots and lots and lots of more people uh, who I think are going to be able to use this. So we're very proud of it. Um, we thought we would be effective like six months ago, but believe it or not, sometimes government moves slowly. Um, well, I guess they were looking at, you know, you're still looking at Madoff and, you know, this guy from FTX. So real busy with that. But the last question that we had to answer, and this is only through November, how in the world can you be up 2.6% when stocks are down 20 and bonds are down 15? They really asked me that. And I said, well, if you look, 25 of the 27 things that are in here file with you every month. So, you know, go around the corner, knock on the office door, and ask those guys, are all these investments up? Yeah, they're pretty much all up. Well, that's how we do it. Um, so the other thing I wanted to mention tonight, um, and I'd hope that we would actually have our December, December numbers in, there's one fund that's always a little late reporting to us, so we have to wait till we get the very last one in, and then Jim and Vion and Erica crunch numbers and produce pretty stuff, but uh, we should have the, the fourth quarter quarterly report out. Um, just any day now. And so uh, I don't know yet whether we were up in December or not. They don't tell me that stuff until it's officially public because they're afraid I might mention it somewhere. So as soon as we get the official word out, then I'll know, and, uh, and then I, we can tell you. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention, uh, this is um, uh, we, we are preparing to batten down the hatches more than we have done. Now, we had to do something very quickly when COVID hit. Remember the market in March of 2020 was down about 33% in one month. And so we acted very quickly there to uh, sell some things while they were up and then buy a lot of stocks while they're down. By the end of the year, most of our portfolios were up about 15% uh, in 2021. So we did our job there. But we're very concerned with where we are. So some of you have heard about the 210 inversion. Very technical. But this is by far the most accurate uh, uh, technical analysis to predict both a market correction and a recession. It's been right 11 of the last 10 times. So 11 times the signals come out. Ten times we actually went into recession. The problem with it is it's like trying to, trying to time a 100-yard dash with a sundial. It's not very precise. It basically says sometime in the next six to 24 months, this is going to happen. However, working with one of uh, the best research, team, research teams we've ever known, we've known these guys for about 15 years, uh, we've been able to get more precise. So technically, uh, let me see if I've got a... 
Do I have a laser on this, Erica? Is that the red dot? Yeah, there we go. All right, so um, two-ten inversion. If you remember when you used to walk in a bank and look at rates, they had you know one-year CD pays one percent, a five-year CD pays five percent, and and so the the longer you're willing to commit your money, the higher the rate would go. That's called a yield curve, and so theoretically, shorter-term uh, instruments should be lower, longer-term instruments should be higher. Well, this signal has to do with the two-year treasury and the ten-year treasury, and so any time they invert, and the two years paying more than the ten-year. That's the first of these danger signals, and that happened back on July the 6th. And you can see that it opened up to the point where the two-year was paying like a whole percentage point more than the 10-year. The second thing that happens, and this helps us to get more precise, is the Federal Reserve then starts raising interest rates. And so what we see here is that we subtract the Fed funds rate from the two-year treasury uh, right here, there's a big gap between the two of them, but you see the Fed funds rates come up, 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 up. I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong slide. Here we go. Um, and so um, the two-year the, the two year was much, much higher than the Fed funds rate. I mean, you can see the percentage here. Uh, what is that, 3 4 5%? Um, so what's happened here, though, is the Fed funds rate has come up, 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 and now right here, it's slightly higher than the two-year treasury. So that's the second thing that happens. Now there's one more thing that happens that I'm not going to talk about tonight because I don't have a graph to show you and it's very complex. But we're watching it like a hawk. And if the current trends continue, sometime in the next 30 to 90 days, we believe that's where the big tip over is going to be. Now one of the things that's difficult about this is you almost always get a big rally right before the cliff comes. And so we're watching it very closely. We've got a few more moves we're going to make. About 10% of the portfolio is going to tweak between three different categories. But um, we're ready to batten down the hatches, have a, a very defensive position, uh, but have some things that should be up so that when the market comes down, we'll have things up that we can sell so we can buy stocks while they're down. Uh, this helps us mitigate uh, risk, mitigate volatility, and we can actually make I mean, we made, I mean, it was a terrible time, obviously, with all the... Uh, sickness and death and loss of jobs and depression and kids out of school and all that. Um, but our job, you know, first and foremost, was to protect your portfolios. And so I would never wish that again, but we actually took advantage of the opportunities that were presented to us and did very well, you know, throughout 2020. Uh, 2020. So we were uh, concerned about this sort of thing coming up soon. It's not exact. It's not precise. You know, history re uh, doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And so, you know, it could be different this time. Uh, but we don't think so. And we're looking at probably 20 different economists. The vast majority of them agree with what we're considering here. And so we're going to work real hard to, to make sure that we uh, help you through this. Uh, and so what I would say to you is if you have friends, if you have family, colleagues, neighbors, um, if they have advisors that are just using stocks and bonds, you know, they got beat up last year. They're feeling a little bit better because things have bounced back a little bit. Um, but have them, you know, drop in and see us because uh, we think that it's going to get worse this year than it was last year. And we have answers for that. So with that, um, we are delighted. Uh, we were gathered in this room, I think about 12 years ago, with a company that we found called, um, uh, it had two funds, the Industrial Income Trust, the Industrial Property Trust, a little co company called Dividend Capital, uh, based out in Colorado. Uh, some of you were with us about five years ago when Dr. Glenn Muller is one of the best uh, economists in real estate uh, that we know. Uh, he not only teaches at the University of uh, Denver, but he is guest taught at you know uh, University of Chicago, Harvard, Yale, you know um, some of the very best schools in the country on real estate and economics. So we had him about five years ago. But what happened is they changed their name to Black Creek. Uh, we did very well with all three of those portfolios, and then they had a big old New York firm that Jim and I were kicking the tires with about six or seven years ago, uh, gobbled them up. And so in addition to bringing to us real estate, they now have some of the very best private credit we've seen and some very good private equity. So Jim has been very busy evaluating their funds, and um, uh, you've, we already have the Black Creek Real Estate Fund in here, but you're going to start seeing that name, I'm pretty confident, uh, in the next few months with some of their other offerings. So I'm delighted to bring up um, our Vice President, Managing Director, more important than a Vice President. Um, uh, Brandon is just tremendous. He um, uh, went to Hillsdale University undergrad, uh, the Booth School at the University of Chicago, Incredible education, was at Goldman for a while, but he's one of the shining stars that uh, the reason why Aries, you know, scooped them up. Uh, I should also mention our host tonight, Dan Feathers. Um, believe it or not, 
Dan is actually the son of my best friend from college, or from high school, actually. We went to high school together. And uh, I was so thrilled when uh, he found his way to Black Creek. Um, he was also with Jackson National Variable Nudies, which we've used in the past. But uh, Dan's hosting this for us, and uh, Brandon's here, Brandon McCurdy. Um, and so he's going to do a tremendous program for us tonight. And so without any further ado, please help me welcome Brandon McCurdy. Can I grab that? Wonderful. Well, it's really a pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I always love the opportunity to come and talk about private markets um, because I think they're a lot of fun. And I think they are actually often underappreciated uh, as well. So I'd like to tell some stories and hopefully give some background into some of what's going on in the AOG Wealth institutional portfolio. Let's see. We're There we go. Nice. So I, I do like to start with a little bit of story, uh, a little bit of history. I think it helps to give some good context. So uh, if you'll actually indulge me, uh, I'd like to tell a little story about the last, let's call it 30 years of history in the financial markets. Um, one really important trend, thing that's happened, is that more and more of the most innovative entrepreneurial companies in the US are choosing to stay private. They're forgoing an IPO, they're forgoing going and listing on the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ. They're staying private for longer or they're staying private altogether. What that's meant is that around the turn of the century, we had over 8,000 stocks trading on US stock exchanges. Over the last 20 years, that number has dipped down to about half of what it used to be. So there are half as many publicly traded stocks today as there were 20 years ago. <laughs> then you add to that, you think about, okay, so we have way fewer actually publicly listed securities to, to choose from. I compare that to what's going on in the private markets. So if you look at this top right hand donut chart, there are far more private large companies in the US than there are uh, publicly traded large companies. And in fact, I mentioned if you look at that number 4,200 publicly traded companies in the US today, there are 17,000 large privately held companies in the US today. That's just large companies. If we look at small and mid-sized companies, there are about 200,000 mid-sized companies in the US. They uh, create about a third of the wealth uh, in the US, about a third of the US employment. Only 3% of those 200,000 mid-sized companies uh, are publicly traded. The vast majority are private. So the private markets, privately held companies, it's a much larger sandbox. It's a much larger market to look at. So if you're just indexing your equity exposure, if you're just using an index fund, you're only indexing approximately one-sixth of U.S. large companies and about one-thirty-second of U.S. mid-sized companies. So the private markets are incredibly powerful. I'd call them the beating heart and soul of the American economy. So that's what's been going on in equity. And if we think about fixed income, 30 years in, uh, in lending and in bond investing, these uh, these names up here are a little bit small, but I'm originally a Chicago boy. So this is a little bit of a sad story for me because some of the big Chicago names and banks, Continental Illinois, for instance, or LaSalle Bank, classic old Chicago banks, those have become part of Bank of America Merrill Lynch. Uh, middle column, First Chicago, Bank One, those have become part of J.P. Morgan Chase. The same thing has happened with Wells Fargo. So you've had this since the late 80s, so the savings and loans crisis, You've had this incredible combination of banks happening all across the country so that there are fewer and fewer banks, and they're much, much larger. And what has that meant for their customers, the small and mid-sized businesses across America that actually need to borrow money from them? Well, they're not making all the same loans that they always did to those same customers. They're actually more interested in working with larger companies that is going to actually move the needle more for their bottom line. They're more interested in working with larger companies that they can cross-sell to investment banking and mergers and acquisition and buying derivatives. And so what's happened is as you've had this massive drop in the number of 
uh, banks that exist in the U.S. over the last many decades. Then you've had a big drop in the number of commercial and industrial loans. So that bottom right-hand uh, chart actually shows the drop in commercial and industrial loans that banks make. And so what that's meant, in some ways, may be a little bit sad, but it has provided an opportunity for firms like Aries to come in and become a private lender. And nowadays, private lenders are actually driving most of and, and providing most of the capital that small and mid-sized businesses across the U.S. Uh, actually need to, to continue to grow. Um, so it's created an opportunity for firms like ours. And so when Fred talked about you know, potentially adding um, some new private credit into the AOG fund coming up, that's exactly what he's talking about, lending to mid- and small-sized businesses across the U.S. to continue to help them to grow because the banks have been stepping back uh, out of those markets. So if you feel like you've been hearing more the last couple years about private markets, these are a couple of the reasons why. This is what's been actually going on in the background. Um, now, I've mentioned private markets a couple of times. Let me actually make sure that we're all on the same page. What do I mean when I talk about private markets? There are three main private market asset classes. The first is private equity. So just like stock that you would buy, except it's not listed on the exchange, it's owned by a select group of people. But it's just a, a business uh, that you own. So that's private equity. Private credit or private debt it goes by different names. But that's just lending. Instead of a bank lending or instead of a bond that's issued and trading on a stock exchange, it's a group of people or a company that get together and directly make a loan to a business. Uh, and then the, the final kind of category of private markets is what we call private real assets. And you can split that into real estate and also into infrastructure. So owning individual properties privately, not listed on an exchange, or uh, owning individual infrastructure projects, again, privately, not listed on an exchange. So let's walk through each of those uh, three, and I can give a little bit more background into what's been happening in, uh, in those three main private market asset classes. So private equity to, to start with. Um, and I think the headline really says, uh, says it all. Relative to public equity, private equity has delivered better returns. So we show uh, a chart here the last 30 years, so going back to 1992, 1992 to, to uh, 2022, just towards the end of uh, last year. If you'd put $100,000 into a few different types of stocks. So there's two lines. There's a, like a blue, mid-blue line and a gray blue line here, or a gray line. You almost can't tell uh, that there are two lines because they're quite overlaid to each other, but one is global stocks and one is U.S. large stocks, the S&P 500. So if you put $100,000 into either global or large U.S. stocks 30 years ago, uh, that 100000 grew to about $1.1 million. If you put $100,000 into small and mid-sized publicly traded stocks in the U.S., uh, that's that uh, middle, there's a darker blue line, that grew to about $2.3 million. If you put 100000 into private equity uh, 30 years ago, that's a gold line. It would have grown to, to $6 million. And so how is there such this big difference? Are we taking on way more risk when we get into private equity to get those extra returns? Actually, it turns out that is not the case. Private equity not only tends to grow faster and give more returns for its holders, it actually tends to avoid a lot of the blow-ups. So what we're showing here are drawdowns, the, the drops that happened in times of crises. So on the left-hand side, we have uh, public equity, and the gray bars are the drawdowns during the global financial crisis. And so whether you look at U.S. large stocks or global large stocks or small and mid stocks, they all drew down or dropped roughly 40 to 45 percent from their top to their bottom point during the global financial crisis. The teal bars then are how they dropped during COVID, so the most recent uh, crisis. And that was uh, kind of roughly in the, the 20 to 30 percent uh, range that they dropped out. So that's what we're used to if we're investing in the, the public equity or the, the public stock markets. And then you see this kind of other box on the right, and that's how private equity, two of the main measures of private equity, that's how those reacted or dropped out during those same two time periods. So they dropped uh, roughly half, kind of between 20 and 25 percent uh, during the global financial crisis, and they dropped uh, just roughly 10 percent or so during COVID. So they managed to actually avoid a lot of the same drops 
that you'll see in the public equity markets. Not only do they tend to draw down less or go down less during crises, they actually tend to recover quicker too. So this chart here uh, on the right, what we're showing, the gray line, that's U.S. large stocks. And from their peak before the global financial crisis to when they fell and until they got back up to their prior peak, it actually took them about 21 quarters. So just over five years for them to recover their previous high. Those dark two lines, the two measures of private equity, those took about half as long to recover and reach back to their previous peak. So again, it's not just better growth, but actually private equity managers, private owners of companies tend to be better at avoiding those big blowups. And in fact, you saw it from the underlying companies themselves. For a couple years after the global financial crisis, large public companies continued to lay off uh, employees and to reduce staff. Meanwhile, privately held companies were hiring in droves in the years after the global financial crisis. So that's private equity. Uh, let's look at actually private lending. We talked about banks moving or, or leaving the space, um, and now private lenders like ourselves have come in to fill that, that open white space. A little bit of the same chart. This is just the growth. If you had owned uh, private equity over the last 30 years. That's that top line. Your 100,000 would have grown to 2.5 million. Uh, and we show that versus two other publicly uh, traded bonds, two measures. Uh, one is the Barclays Ag, kind of the typical conservative uh, index, a nice mix of bonds. That 100,000 would have grown to 400,000. Um, and we also show leveraged loans. That's like the publicly traded uh, equivalent of, uh, of private credit or private lending. So the growth has been, has been very good. Where is that growth coming from? So what we're showing here are the yields. So the top line is the yield of private credit. And you can see it's quite a bit higher than either the publicly traded uh, leverage loans or bank loans or just the, the risk-free rate, uh, what we call LIBOR here. So the, uh, consistently getting a higher yield over time, consistently getting higher coupons is what leads to that much higher return. There's really three pieces of return that go into to that yield. So three pieces to that higher yield. The first is just interest rates. Whatever interest rates are, we bump along. So kind of this bottom dotted line, that's part of the underlying yield of the, the private lending. Then on top of that, the second piece of the yield is what's called the spread. And it's just what you get paid for the risk that you take on when, when you're lending to a, a smaller mid-sized business. And then the third piece of the, the yield or the return is what's called underwriting fees or origination fees. It's just like, it's very similar to, to sometimes the fees you pay uh, when you take out a, a new mortgage. So same thing when a company takes out uh, a new loan, they pay a couple percent upfront in fees. In, if you're buying loans from a bank or publicly traded loans, the bank's actually eating that two to three percent. That, that's their earnings. But when you work with a private lender, private lenders pass that through to their underlying investors, and that's where you're getting uh, that extra higher yield from. Now, this chart is a little bit old. We're waiting for some of the new uh, index data to update. What you'll actually see is the 8% yield has popped up to about 11% right now. So right now, in, in, uh, in private credit or this private lending, you're getting about 11% uh, yield. And that's really important because inflation right now, people are very excited that they're getting now you know, 4%, 4.5% on government bonds, that's still well below the level of inflation that's in the high single digits. So there's still this insidious, silent tax of inflation that's eating away at the value of our dollars unless we're able to, to beat it. And this is, this is one way to actually do it. Now, maybe one other uh, note about direct lending. There's this little uh, 1L here, and that means first lien. So something important about that first lien, that means that when we're lending to a business, we're the first creditors in line if something happened to go wrong. Right? So it means we're the first ones to get paid back. That's really important. It also means that something that's not listed there is these are what are called senior secured loans. And secured means that we actually have collateral. So very much like when you take out a mortgage, if you stop paying your mortgage, the bank can come and take your house and sell it to actually get back the money that they lent to you. And it's the very same concept when we lend to a business, we get collateral, whether it's property, whether it's plant and equipment, 
uh, or whether it's intellectual property, like copyrights, uh, we have a way, if the worst were to happen with a business, we actually have a way to, to come back and collect. And that's part of why, uh, over time, this direct lending has been, uh, has been so safe, frankly. So just to give you um, some numbers, in the public markets, the bank loans or leverage loans, they have about a 2% default rate, meaning about 2% of the time um, the, the underlying business doesn't pay on time or they skip out on a payment altogether. Uh, our default rate in the loans that we've made over the past 20 years is 0.2%, so less than 1%, so one-tenth of the default rate in the public market. Uh, the loss rate, the actual amount that we've lost, is zero, whereas in the public markets, it's uh, it's about one percent. And again, it's by having that really good collateral that actually makes sure that we don't ever have to take losses, even even when the worst does happen. So the the third uh, big private market asset class then is the real assets. And again, by real assets, mostly we're talking about real estate uh, and infrastructure. So uh, this is what's called a drawdown chart. It's a little bit different way to think about returns. Instead of showing it going up, we just say we don't care when it goes up. We only want to look at when it goes down. Whenever it's going up, we put it flat across the top, and we only show where it, uh, where it draws down or where there are losses. The dark lines are private real estate, and the lighter lines are public real estate. And this data goes back to 1978. So we're looking back over the last 45 years or so. And what we can see over the 45 years, first of all, at a first glance, you can kind of see that there are far fewer drawdowns, and the drawdowns tend to be less extreme in private real estate, in the dark line, than with the light lines. Um, and in fact, that is the case over the last 45 years. There have been 25 separate drawdowns in public real estate, only three drawdowns in private real estate over the last 45 years. So it tends to be less volatile. It tends to be a much smoother ride uh, in private real estate versus in publicly traded REITs. And it's very much the same story. Dark line here with private infrastructure. The light line is publicly traded infrastructure. So we have a, a smoother, nicer ride. It makes for a better investing experience, uh, generally being private in real assets. Bless you. Now, there's this other really interesting fact. So this is great that it's less volatile, it's a smoother ride, but what's different about real assets versus private equity and versus private credit that would make us also want to include them in the portfolio? Well, there are, there's a very interesting property of real assets, which is that it tends to do very well during periods of inflation. And this is one way we can think about it. We show here two different types of real estate, um, multifamily, residential, and industrial real estate. By industrial, we don't mean like factories with chimneys necessarily, but more like warehouses and logistics facilities. So these are two of the most popular types of uh, real estate right now. And under each type of real estate, we show three different uh, inflation uh, periods or regimes. So again, this is data going back to 1978. We took every individual quarter going back to 1978, so over the last 45 years, and we divided each of those quarters up into three different buckets. Lowest volatility buckets, the middle third, um, sorry, not volatility, the lowest inflation uh, periods, the middle third of inflation quarters, and then the highest inflation quarters. And then we looked at what were actually the returns of those two different types of real estate. So the real estate did perfectly fine during low uh, inflation periods, but you can actually see it's the medium and especially the high inflation periods, the ones where we have those dotted lines around. The high inflation periods is where real estate really shined. The returns were up into the mid-teens. So the higher the inflation went, the better real estate did. It's a great way to protect uh, our portfolios when, when we're in those higher periods of inflation. Bring that up now because we think for the next decade we're going to be in a higher inflation regime um, than we've been in for, for the last number of decades. So that's real estate. Focus on that, but the, the story is very similar with infrastructure. Infrastructure did very well in terms of its returns in both low and medium uh, inflation periods. It's not quite clear because there's not that very uh, nice, clear stair step there, but you can see, again, when there's high inflation, it pops up and its returns are also higher. So it's got that really nice characteristic to it that makes it such a nice diversifier, an add-on 
along with the, the private equity and the private credit. So just thinking about the market environment now, I've already peppered in a little bit of why we think these are um, some pretty interesting investments uh, at, the, at the current time. I think one other important uh, consideration to, to think about is just what, what's been kind of the evolution of these asset classes. Why haven't most of us individual investors heard too much necessarily about them? The really interesting thing is that institutional investors, so think about public pensions, uh, Virginia teachers, Illinois teachers, um, California uh, state uh, public uh, retirement system, firefighters, hospital workers, their pensions have been investing in these three private market asset classes for many, many years. Same thing with insurance companies, same things with uh, endowments for universities, foundations for uh, for religious uh, organizations, for instance. And that's part of the reason private equity, for instance, is as big as it is today. It's a $6.3 trillion industry today. But you can see that's really rather a drop in the bucket versus how big the public equity markets are. Um, and so, you know, it's still just one thirteenth the size of the public equity markets. But if all those, for instance, teachers and firefighters and, and police officers are using 20 to 50 percent of these asset classes as part of their pension portfolios, then we'd say very much like, why aren't we all using them for our, for our own retirement, for our own uh, savings growth? And as individual investors start to find and discover these asset classes and start to use them more, very much like through the AOG institutional portfolio, we think there's going to be quite a bit of catch up. I don't know if it will ever get quite as large as the, the public markets. We think there's a lot of catch up still left to happen in private equity. And I think the story is actually very similar for, for the private lending, the private credit uh, as well. I think to end with then, um, although that is kind of a, a nice note, what's really critical is how do all these things, of course we all want returns, of course we all want growth of our dollars, but how do these things all tie back to our own personal portfolios and, and goals? Because that's why we're doing this all at the end of the day. There's, there are goals that we're all reaching for that are more personal to us. And it, as we think about some of the challenges that we're facing in the market today and probably over the next few years, increased volatility, persistent inflation, rising interest rates, then these asset classes each bring something unique to a more traditional portfolio. They help decrease the volatility. By decreasing the volatility, that actually gives us all a smoother ride, which means we're less likely to be undisciplined. We're less likely to want to sell out at the, the worst time. We're more likely to listen to our financial advisors who tell us to stay invested, right? Inflation, by keeping pace with that stealth tax of inflation by making sure that we're keeping our yields, our income, for instance, above the level of inflation, using real assets to keep up and actually increase our returns during inflation, uh, and it helps keep us uh, ahead of that very insidious uh, force. And then finally, rising interest rates. An awful lot of investors were surprised last year to see their bond portfolios actually lose money, and lose a good bit of money. By using private credit, for instance, where the, they're actually floating rates, so as interest rates rise, actually so does the yield and the income. It helps you keep up and actually make more during periods of rising interest rates. Um, and so producing meaningful income, keeping pace with the stealth tax of inflation, and then helping us stay invested, stick with the plan that our advisors set out, uh, those are some of the things that private markets can also often be helpful with. So, let me pause there. Uh, I don't want to stay between us and in, uh, in dinner, um, but very happy to answer questions. And I think, in fact, maybe I'll take a couple now um, if, if we have time since the dinner hasn't quite come, but then I'm going to float around later between the tables. So very answer, uh, very happy to answer uh, more specific questions as well. So if there are any general ones to begin with, very happy to take them. Yeah, sir. You showed a slide that talks about how private equity can bounce back faster from mm -hmm. Global, yeah, global financial crisis. Yeah. 
So there are a couple reasons. One, it, it does help when you don't draw down as much to begin with. A lot of the reason where you have these big drawdowns in the public markets, some of it's certainly driven by fundamentals and, and not as good of an outlook for the underlying businesses, but so much of what happens with stock prices is driven by sentiment. It's driven by the underlying investors needing liquidity, needing to get at dollars, and so they're just willing to sell and, and if there are no other real buyers there, that's where you'll see the price drop. So very often it's more emotion, uh, it's more situational reasons why you have such big swings uh, in the stock markets. There's, it's actually, it's a, it's a funny, I call it an academic quandary. There are a lot of uh, university professors and PhDs that don't actually know why the stock market is as volatile as it is. If you actually look at all the models that work in lots of different ways, those models don't expect public stock markets to be as volatile as they are. So it's, a, it's like an academic quandary. And really, we think a lot of that reason, again, comes from the emotional driven selling, what's just happening with macro concerns. So because private equity just doesn't price as much, you, when, we hold, when we buy a company at Aries, we're, we're buying it for five, six, seven years and we don't care what happens in the interim. And of course, we're gonna, we'll mark it down if something really bad is happening with the business, but there's nothing forcing the price up or down uh, other than what we're actually making with, with the earnings. Um, um, just to kind of expand on that, when Jim and I were looking at Carlisle and KKR about 10 years ago, that's, those are the first true institutional private equity funds that we got access to, uh, we asked them, you know, the stock market was down 50%. Why would you? Why did you only mark down 15 percent? And they said, "Well, our company's definitely a little bit less valuable." But remember, those private equity funds can call cash in. So you know, think about it. When do you want to have the most money if you're going to go shopping? Well, the day after Christmas sale or the Black Monday after Thanksgiving, you know, whatever. Whenever people do a lot of shopping at discounts, um, and so the ability to draw private uh, extra cash in to buy stuff while they're down, the fact that there was no panic selling going. Um, you know, so when we talk to them, you know, stocks are down. Oh, sorry. Stocks are down. You know, stocks are down 50 percent, um, and yet they're marking down about 15 percent. But they said, "Boy, oh boy, we didn't like it. We didn't like marking down 15 percent." But oh my goodness, the option, the opportunities that we had, you know, to go shopping and buy things at deep discount. And remember, you know, Warren Buffett's made a career not just in buying other private equity companies, but going and buying public companies and taking them private again. So it's not like the, the people that are buying private equity, that are buying new companies, are restricted only to private companies. When public stocks are down a bunch, they can go and buy a whole company at a big discount and take it private. So you know, Jim and I first started looking at that more than 10 years ago. Um, that was the first truly institutional private equity funds. I wish we'd have them all back in 2012 would save us a lot of heartache on some of the ones that weren't institutional. But uh, you know, we started buying institutional funds about 2012, and then by 2018, all institutional. And that's why we put it in the name of our fund, is we want to be diversified, and we want to own institutional managers. If I could, maybe I'll riff off that with, uh, with a story, because I think that's such, such a good point about it's not, you don't just have to go out and buy a private company. We, we have the option to go buy public companies. And if I think back, I think it was about 2000, I think it was 2011, 2012 time frame. Uh, you might remember it because it, it was in the news a decent bit. Michael Dell, of course, the, the founder of the computer company, uh, he realized that his old hardware business was becoming commoditized and that the future was much more in the software and the consulting and the services parts of his business. And so he was pushing his publicly traded company, Dell Computers, to, to drop or roll off some more of that kind of commoditized hardware part of the business and focus much more on the software and, and consulting business. But it became a big fight with the other shareholders. The shareholders didn't like the idea of not getting the same level of dividends that they had for the next bunch of years. They didn't like the idea of potentially giving up returns, seeing the, the stock drop for a few years as all these new investments were made. And so it became a big shareholder fight. In the end, Michael Dell had to work with a private equity company to go in, 
take his publicly traded company private, take it off the exchange so that he could put in and institute those longer term changes that were going to take five, six, seven years of investment to, to actually pay off. And that's in fact what they did in the end. And now Dell has actually it, it's seen that out and they're getting ready to, to sell it now. Um, so it's that the longer time frame that a private equity owner has, you're not answering to analysts on the street, on Wall Street earning calls every quarter, that the long-term time frame allows you to potentially take some, some losses or to see uh, earnings go down, make big investments, because you don't care what the return is at the end of year one, two, three, or four. It's more what you care about is how is that company going to be in year five, six, seven, when you're actually ready to, to sell it. So that longer time frame, I think, actually matches much better with the, in the investment time frame that, that we all have. And that, that's part of the reason you see those big uh, outsized returns over time. The, the governance model for privately held firms, we think, is fundamentally more sound. With that, um, I'll leave it, uh, Fred, if you want to make any uh, last comments. And then uh, I'm going to I'll come around. Uh, oh, no, to no, no, you're no? not getting off that easy. All right, good. All right. If you guys aren't going to ask questions, I'm going to help you out. Um, so one of the things that we've learned is that there's so much talent coming out of business schools like Booth School in Chicago that go into uh, buying uh, and uh, managing public stocks, that the differential between fantastic managers and mediocre managers, not that great. Why is there such a big differential between the top private equity managers and, say, the, the, the top quartile, say, and everybody else? Yeah. Uh, that's a really interesting one, actually. Um, and it is kind of an old or well-known fact at this point that in the public markets, uh, the, even the median or the, the middle uh, public market mutual fund manager or investor uh, doesn't, make, uh, the, doesn't make more money than they charge in fees over, the, over and above the, the stock markets. So it's very tough to make money in the, in the stock market. And I think part of the reason you see much more differentiation in the, the private markets is because the way you make money in the private markets is going in and running and operating a business differently. So when we're buying a business, before we buy it, we have a whole game plan. We've got a seven-year plan set out of exactly what we're going to do with that business. And it's much more about how are we operating? How are we going to change the compensation model for the sales team? How are we going to change or work with the suppliers to make our manufacturing process uh, more efficient. Um, it, it can also be like, how are we going to change the, you know, we can change the light bulbs, we can change the buildings, uh, we can do everything, but it's, it's actually getting in, rolling up our sleeves and getting our, our hands dirty. You notice I didn't wear a tie tonight. Private equity tends not to wear ties. We are much more about going in, again, rolling up sleeves and, and operating businesses, and that's where, that, that's where actually the value creation comes from. So we, we had a great run with uh, dividend capital, with the Inve Industrial Income Trust, the Industrial Property Trust, uh, then Black Creek. Um, but one of the things that's been really fun to see is, you know, you and Dan having to now say, wow, we're at Aries, and we have to learn these other two additional asset classes. You had some background already, but um, let's talk about um, when you have a private credit shop that's making loans, how helpful is it to have a private equity shop they can run those companies, and they can consult back and forth. You know, if you're if you've made a loan, if you're making a loan to Avis, but your private equity is running Hertz, uh, how does that synergy work out? And then maybe talk a little bit about loan to own. Okay, cool. Um, so a little bit different for for me in that I was hired by Aries, so I never I've, I've always done everything. And in fact, before this, I was a portfolio manager for many years overseeing private equity, private credit, infrastructure, and real estate, and thinking about how they all, they all fit together. Um, and I think it's the intersection between them and the way they play off of each other that, that makes them such good, good partners in a portfolio together. But partners all in the same firm, that's a really interesting question because, yes, what, what does it do or is there a benefit to having a private lender that's also connected with private equity shop that's going out and buying the companies? And the answer is yes. So one of the really interesting things, like for us, for instance, Aries is the largest non-bank lender in the world. So we make more loans um, outside of banks, of course. But we make more loans to private businesses than any other institution that there is. And what's so interesting about that 
is if there's a private equity deal, for instance, that goes on in the US, there is a very high probability that they're coming to us to try and get the funding for that business. So we're seeing almost all the transactions. We're seeing almost so, such a large swath of the US economy in terms of the, the businesses. Um, we get to see their financials. We're thinking through forward looking what's likely to happen with them. So we have a massive data set essentially of, of private companies throughout the US um, to go off of. And in the private markets, more information is, is actually more powerful and makes you better at what you do um, because you can see different business models, you can see what's working, what's not. So what's really nice is when we go in, of course we're never going to lend to a business that we also own, so we're never gonna conflict ourselves that way. Um, but what's really nice is with competitors or with businesses that we haven't seen before, our equity team can walk across the hallway to the fixed income team, who's to the lending team, who's probably seen either that business in the past, and they might have lent to them in the past, or they've seen their competitors in the past, and they already have all the financials, they already have their business plan set out, and so the, it just gives you such a jump start when you're looking at a business to think about what can we do here, what have we seen work, what have we seen not work. Um, it's, it's a great point. So I'll ask one more question, and then I think the stakes are on the way. I think I hear the sizzling going on back in the kitchen right now. Um, so, uh, Jim, I don't know if he was brilliant or if he's like a dirty rat, but um, you know, Jim and I have done due diligence trips, obviously, for about 20 years together. Uh, but we wanted to give exposure to Frank Srudi, to Aaron Holt, to Lydia Goslin, and Miguel Bremer. Um, and so Jim set up a trip, but he stayed home and made us go do it. And we went to New York for three days, and we saw nine firms in three days, and we looked at like 40 funds. I mean, it was just crazy. But one of the things that I still shake my head about is when we actually met the head of your credit division, I had never heard, as many of you were with Alrock that we got into about six or seven years ago. Um, Jim and I met um, uh, Doug Ostrover, the O in Alrock OWL, probably 10 years ago. And we even had Mark Lipschultz came and spoke to our client group maybe six years ago. Um, so we had exposure to what I thought was probably the best credit shop you know, in New York. And then we go and meet Moshe, and we look at his track record. Uh, talk about just the extraordinary track record that you have uh, managing private credit at Aries. Sure. Um, so one of the nice things is not only are we one of the longest standing, we were one of the first to really start doing this, this private lending. And not only are we the, the largest, um, but actually we do have really um, what I would say is the most phenomenal track record. And, and if the returns are very good and stack up against everyone, but what we're most proud of is actually what happens on the loss side. So the fact that we have that 0.2% default rate. And a default could just mean someone being late on a payment, but even that is essentially zero, far under 1%, uh, way less than any competitors or than the public markets. I think especially proud of the 0% loss rate. And again, we've been operating now since 1997. Um, so the, the fact that we've never, we've not lost money on any of the loans through, again, global financial crisis, um, through all kinds of issues in, in Europe, uh, European sovereign crisis, um, and then of, of course COVID most recently, and, and then some of the troubles just this last year that have been challenging. I think part of that comes from a few things. First of all, the when people come to Aries, when they finally find their way there, they, they don't leave, they want to stay. Like I can just say the culture at Aries is it's very family-like, it's very professional and hardworking, but it's very balanced. I worked at Goldman Sachs, it was a little less balanced. Uh, so I, I can say from experience, working at a few different places, that Aries is the best balance of teamwork and collaboration, people working together and really enjoying being together. And so all of the top uh, portfolio managers, all the top deal teams, like they've been there for 10, 20 years, and they all expect to end their careers there. And so for us, you know, a lot of our number eight or 10 or 20 portfolio manager or deal person uh, on our team could go be the head person somewhere else, uh, but they're not interested to. And I think it's, it's that everyone working together for so long, knowing each other well, trusting each other, that's part of what's allowed us to, to do that. And I, th I think it's a really special place. That's what's actually made those returns sustainable. So one of the things I'll, uh, I'll mention just to kind of wrap up, I mean, um, I think you saw on the charts here um, it is possible for a private equity 
private credit and commercial real estate all to have down years. Um, you know, commercial real estate, uh, four years in the last 43. Um, you know, private equity during the great financial uh, crisis, um, you know, down, the, the, the best institutional managers down about 15%. So it's not like this is a perfect plan that you, know, you can never lose money on. However, um, it's just a great strategy as a core holding. And <clears throat> honestly, you know, when we did, first started thinking about this, when I actually started thinking about five years ago, um, and we were just kind of um, uh, beginning to heat it up uh, in January of 2020, and then COVID hit, back of the burner. We had too many other things we had to do. <clears throat> but um, I really became convinced that it was just too hard to do this endowment style model. And you, those of you that went with this for a while, you know, all the perspectives you had to look at, all the applications you had to sign, money out, money in, what we would call the thrash or just the hassle factor. And so, um, uh, you know, I spoke to a couple of law firms, a couple of accounting firms, and I think it may be the only time that I brought up an idea with Jim and Michelle that the first time they heard it, they said, why haven't you shared this with us sooner? Of course we need to do this. And in the back of my mind, I thought, you know, it's possible that this could be popular and we might use it beyond AOG, but it was 99.9% .9 about you. And it's only because you, we've earned your trust and you, and you have um, uh, seen the benefit of this and lots of these education meetings that we were able to get this. We're at about $60 million. Um, but now that we can open it to others, we already have commitments from other firms, you know, to probably double that in size and, and then keep going from there. And as we get a little bit more size to it, we can negotiate better and better deals. We've already put a little pressure on these guys. You know, we want a little bit lower fees because we're writing bigger and bigger checks. But even beyond that, uh, we're getting access to things I thought we would be able to. But until uh, Jim set up that, that meeting, uh, that series of meetings for us in New York, we were able to confirm at every stop. Yes, with this kind of fund, with, by, by aggregating your buying power, you're going to get access not just to institutional firms that have retail funds, but now to the institutional firms and their institutional funds that have, uh, they're harder to get into, they're a little bit pickier about who gets to invest in them, and they have lower fees. So as we continue to grow the fund and by letting other investors come in, it's going to lower the fees for everybody. Uh, and it really was all about you. But because we were focused on you and doing the right thing, um, I think it's going to be popular with other uh, investors. And again, allow us to work with just the very best professionals uh, that we've ever seen. This was kind of our hope when we first started doing this, and now it's a realization. So I want to thank you all. Um, we didn't put the other picture up here about our, our New York trip. Many of you saw uh, on LinkedIn and Facebook um, that we had a chance to um, uh, do a little publicity with the NASDAQ in Times Square. And uh, that was just the warm-up act. We're going to go back and do a full media day with them because of this fund and because we can bring 25 or 30 or 35 different funds of this quality, um, not only to our accredited investors, but now even to investors that are not yet accredited. So um, this is just really fun. We've been working our tails off. Um, but um, it's because of you and because of uh, your trust in us and us, the commitment that we've made to you to do the very best job we can possibly do you know, that we're able to do this now. So I want to thank you all. And with that, um, let's have some nice dinner. Um, Brendan's going to come around, you know, table by table. So maybe some of you are a little bit shy about asking a question in front of everybody. Uh, but this will actually end our streaming session. So bye, everybody that's been joining us uh, through the internet. Um, enjoy whatever dinner you're eating that's not Ruth's Chris. And uh, <laughs> next time, show up, and you might do a little better. <laughs> but no, we've got a lot of fun stuff. Did I skip the slide, Erica? Did, didn't we have future events somewhere? Did I? I missed it. Put it back up? Uh, if you could just do a quick, if you don't mind. Um, so some of you know that obviously with COVID, that sort of derailed some of these education events and fun things we do. And then we had this great uh, holiday party planned for you. And then Reston Town Center did not cooperate because they decided to take the skating rink down and take the fountain down uh, to help the plumbing. So we're going to do it again next year. Um, oh. oh, OK, thanks. Um, let's see. There we go. OK. So we're going to do it again in December, but this year, oh, also the movie theater, Fairfax County is a little slow on zoning. So um, we're going to maybe do some sort of holiday movie. We're going to do ice skating, um, carriage rides, food somewhere. 
um, but it should be a really fun time. And this is like a family thing, too. You know, bring kids, bring grandkids, just whoever wants to come. I will have a good time with that. We've got another pure education seminar set up um, actually at the Ruth's Chris Ruston Town Center uh, in October. That should be opening up in about six weeks. Uh, we're going to do something really fun out at, um, I'm not sure where this is, one of the wineries or something in Western Loudoun, I think. But um, uh, we previewed this, and it looks like it's going to be a lot of fun. Again, the whole family can come. And uh, mid-year financial update, hopefully we're going to have a really top-tier speaker. We're still working to confirm it. But we think we're going to have a, a, a world-renowned economist, uh, not Brian Westbury. We've heard from him before, um, to present the mid-year update. And it should be very interesting to see what's happened when June comes. Um, and then we have our traditional ladies' luncheon coming up in May. And, of course, March Madness this year with four television sets so we can watch all four games that are on at the same time. And we'll have something really good, some kind of um, – it will not be uh, – I guess we did vegetarian one year. It didn't go over big. So it's going to be <laughs> – it's going to be food that has some meat with it, uh, but, you know, some sort of basketball fair. So uh, we're going to have a great time, and uh, we're kind of back on track now that we're post-COVID and, you know, back to our normal operating tempo. So um, come enjoy this. Bring friends, family, colleagues, neighbors. Uh, love to meet uh, people that are important to you and see if there's something we can do to help them out. So, Erica, where are the stakes? Okay, because if they don't come soon, I'm going to start singing. Hey, I've, I've had people pay to hear me sing and pay to hear me stop singing. So, all right. Thanks, everybody. We'll be walking around individual tables. Thanks for coming out tonight. And thank you, Brennan and Dan.